Okay, everybody. I want to help welcome everybody on to our uh, continuing series of websites and how to uh, run eco-friendly landscape companies. Um, tonight, our guest is Joe Magazzi, who's the president of Green Earth Ag and Turf. Uh, I've known Joan for, Joe for quite a few years. Um, I didn't know as much about his background until recently, but uh, he's, he has a bachelor's degree in uh, neurobiology and a master's degree in microbiology um, and has worked a lot with biological products uh, to help control diseases and other pests um, in the landscape industry and in agriculture. Um, so with that, I'm just going to hand it over to Joe. Hi, Joe. Hey, hey, Barry. And thanks for having me on. So I guess this is, um, this is timely as well with the new laws in New Jersey. Right. So hopefully it can help people because yeah, we've had um, problems um, with things not being available to the, the landscapers. It's a frustrating time. So um, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. Products called Beetle Gone and Grub Gone. And I'll explain about them um, and how they can fit into your treatment programs. Um, and really like, you know, what the need is in the market right now. So we've, we've got really three major things converging at the same time for you guys that it must be frustrating. Um, you got Japan, the Japanese beetle impact is growing and spreading throughout the country, certainly here in Connecticut and, you know, the Northeast, you know, where I am in Connecticut, New Jersey, we've been dealing with the Japanese beetles for a long time. Um, it's spreading throughout the country. It's gone west. I can almost heat map this based on this product where I sell. Last year, it was spreading around the Great Lakes. So just more and more. We don't know if it's the weather. It's probably partially due to the weather, um, not getting the deep freezes and the cold during the winter, and the grubs are overwintering. But um, whatever it is, um, the Japanese beetles um, are famous for roses, Virginia creepers. For um, I'm sure we have turf guys on this call that are also doing um, plant health care, um, you know, for the adult beetles, um, some of the uh, flowers and the ornamentals, uh, basil, as far as the edibles, grapes are a big one. We sell a lot to vineyards for the beetle gone products um, and trees as well. If you're doing um, tree care, um, walnuts, ash maples, all are very susceptible to Japanese beetles. Um, yeah. Joe, and, if, uh, I could, if I could add in a little bit of history. Um, sure. Japanese Japanese beetles were first introduced about 100 years ago um, to a, a little farm about 12 miles away from where I live. Really? <laughs> yes. And, and at the time, they sprayed all kinds of nasty stuff trying to control it, but obviously it didn't work. Right. And it came from overseas. There's a lot of things having adapted to this environment. Um, the other thing that's really changed is not just the Japanese beetles that we've known about, but the other species that are now um, common. Um, so oriental beetles, and this is just showing how they're spreading. And of course, we're here in the epicenter for most of you guys here in the Northeast um, and the Asiatic garden beetles as well in terms of the adults. Um, the um, parts of the country have now higher populations of some of these species than Japanese beetle grubs. People generally, when they think of grubs, they think of Japanese beetles. But here in Connecticut, New Jersey, these areas, we actually have more European chafers in terms of the grubs. Um, people just don't know it because you don't see the adults. They're not um, as prevalent or visible. Um, it's the grubs that are doing the damage. So we actually have more European chafers here in this part of the country. The products currently available on the market, especially the organics like Milky Spore we'll talk about, they may work against Japanese beetles um, and the grubs, excuse me, but um, they don't work against any of the other spe uh, species. And we're seeing more and more chemical resistance now um, with the, even the synthetics out there. So we have um, more Japanese and different species that aren't covered. The other thing that's working against you guys, and we were just talking about this, is the bans now coming in place uh, for the synthetics. So the EPA, um, you know, federally is banning a lot of things. Um, you know, some of the um, uh, chlor chlorpyrifos is being, and some of the others, um, uh, organophosphates are being nationally thing. Um, more so and more relevant to this talk is states like New Jersey, um, in fact, just, um, passed the law, right? Last week, Barry, I think, um, they just signed it in, um, banning the neonics um, in, in, um, in New Jersey and New York is following behind too. 
Connecticut, it's already in place, a lot of the pesticide bans on school grounds and stuff. And not only that, it's getting down to the municipality level. Um, here in Connecticut, like Stanford, Connecticut just passed um, laws in Maine. Um, you probably have customers in Maryland. Um, they have separate bans around the watershed area. So we get a lot of calls from there. Um, the good news is products like these, some of these um, organic products are now being exempted in those areas. So it does give you option. The other thing is just the market trend. So um, people are more and more uh, concerned about the environment. And even in this part of the country, um, politically, you know, left, right, we always see the divide. Um, people tend to be, that's one thing where they do cross over is about the environment. We have a lot of beautiful areas here. Um, you know, more and more concern about pollinators. You hear a lot about um, bees and the problems with the pollinators. Um, and the next generation. So you're getting more and more customers as the millennials and the Gen Xers are are getting older and buying houses. And as applicators, you're, those are now your customers. Um, this is gonna get more and more, the, the demand for organics. And um, this, I pulled this off of the Berkshire Hathaway. Um, um, organic products, it's, it's a major driving trend. Um, I found this graph from them, um, from Tech Navio, um, about a 6% growth over the next five years, they're anticipating a year, um, $79 billion market. So you guys are going to get, you know, more and more demand. We're hearing more people are asking for organic products. They don't want this big ones, glyphosate or Roundup, they don't want, but they're more and more chemicals. They're going to hear about the neonics. We don't want neonics. Um, so you guys are going to get people that want to use organics. Um, and it's also the products are coming together with it. So um, we're going to talk about that today. Some of the technology has really come a long way since I started Barry 12 years ago, the products. Um, now the difference is, is tremendous. Um, so you sort of got um, three things coming at you. You got um, more and more Japanese beetles and other beetles. You've got you know, tools being taken out of your tool belt. So the pesticides that do work, they're going away. Um, um, and you have less tools available for a bigger problem and you have more and more people asking for safer options. So, you know, what are your options now as an applicator to treat the grubs and beetles now that um, there's more of them with, with less, less options? Well, that's, that's what I was invited here to talk about. Um, the beetle gone and the grub gone we're gonna talk about today. These are um, non-chemicals, um, they're highly potent. And I'll show you the proof. Um, it, it's amazing what these guys have done. Um, novel mechanism. Um, they're targeted, um, very specific and be safe. They're proven with a bunch of university studies and they're OMRI listed organic and USDA NOP compliant in, in terms of the beetle gone. So these are, um, they're EPA registered, which means they're very stringent for safety and efficacy. They're not 25B products um, and they are OMRI listed. So, um, like I said, organic, they're high performing and they fill vacuums um, that are caused by chemicals being taken off the, um, the market. So, um, anybody have any questions about um, any of the regulations? Um, otherwise, I'll move on. So, I'm going to talk about the current, um, the current market out there, what is available. So, in in terms of the chemical options, which I know a lot of landscapers will cross over, um, there's very few people doing just organics, um, but um, you know you have options such as the neonics, um, organophosphates, the pyrethroids, um, amongst others. A lot of these products uh, may have toxicities to people, some more so than others, animals. Um, certainly most of them beneficial insects, um, pollinators, you know, such as the bees that people worry about. Um, they can pollute waterways, um, which we'll talk about. Um, that's a big issue. And there's the growing number of federal bans on these. So, um, and limitation of use um, is starting to grow because of resistance to these chemicals by the beetles. So um, they tend to knock out a bunch, but not all of them, just like we're seeing with Corona. And some of them come back and they have complete resistance to some of the chemicals there. This is already being seen with some of them. So there's two things for grubs. Um, there's preventative controls, um, things like imidacloprids uh, and the clothionidine um, are the neonics, the neonicotinoids, um, products like Merit and Arena that, that, are, that work well, 
Um, these are the neonics that we talked about earlier that have been banned or are being banned. Um, and then you've got um, the chlorantranilipril um, and the halefinazide. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't sell all the synthetic, so uh, if I hack that, but um, these both work. These are safer in terms of off-target, um, aceliprin and, um, and some of the IGRs, which are insect growth regulators, or the MACs, which are molt accelerating compounds. These work on molting insects, so only a certain type of insect will molt, so it's much more specific. The problem is crustaceans in the water do molt as well, so um, most of these products are banned near water systems, which in New Jersey, Connecticut, in New England, we have a lot of water around. Um, and the other thing, you know, with these is these are all preventatives. So the timing is crucial. They have to be applied before the egg hatch. Um, and as you guys know, as applicators, people tend to be proactive um, or actually, excuse me, be reactive, not proactive. Um, they don't want to pay. It's not my problem. I haven't had grubs in the past. And then they're going to call you when they're mowing their lawn. Um, or the moles are digging up the lawn, or the birds, um, or the skunks, and oh geez, I got a grub problem, what can you do? And um, so, uh, you know, that's also a problem. Only about 10% of lawns will actually get grub infection in any given year. Um, as far as the curative, so once you do get those uh, phone calls, again, you're looking at the organophosphates, um, like Dilox, um, which are, Sort of the nuclear options, um, Bears voluntarily canceled some of its production, um, taken some off the market. Um, some of them are under EPA review right now um, and starting to be banned by the EPA already. Um, Seven is now being banned in certain areas. This has been around for a while. Um, the carbon mates, um, you know, so those are again effective. They kill everything. Um, and that's the problem with with these, especially in the curative, is their broad spectrums. Um, they kill all insects, good and bad. Um, and um, they have higher toxicity because for curatives, you actually have to use higher amounts. So you're gonna have more off target, um, more of the um, toxicities will get enhanced with these when you have to treat curatively. So, um, in, and that was the grub options. These are the beetle options. So, um, you know, the, the synthetic beetle options are basically the same players as um, you have for the grubs. Um, also the pyrethrins, um, which have effects on pollinators, but you know the same imidacloprids, the carbamates um, are being used. In terms of the organic um, chemicals, and when I say organic chemicals, these are products that are organic, but um, they still act like chemicals. Um, you have things like horticultural oils, um, that work, um, limited efficacy, um, they will work against the beetles, but not, not really the grubs. Um, they're, they're actually more repellents in a lot of cases. Um, spinosad is a great organic insecticide. It's, it's sort of um, the go-to for other insects that we, um, that we go to for pests. Um, it's great, um, it's effective, it's broad spectrum. That's the other issue with spinosad. All these are still broad spectrum, even though they're organic. Um, they could potentially, if used incorrectly, have effects on pollinators or beneficials. Um, you got things like pyganic, which is just a organic version of pyrethrins. Um, you're just going to pay a lot more money to have the organic label. It doesn't stick around as much, and it can still affect pollinators. Um, so, you know, you do have these um, on the market. Um, uh, you know, to control the beetles, um, they're broad spectrum, they can harm pollinators as well. So um, we're going to talk about the biocontrols that are available. So non-chemical in the organic market are biocontrols. These are microbes that, um, that attack the insects. Um, their use is limited because in a lot of cases, it's poor efficacy. They could be expensive and difficult to produce and handle. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and, and expensive. So this is the current market right now, um, which includes things um, like um, beneficial nematodes, if any of you guys have tried to use these. Um, there's uh, beneficial uh, nematode, which are found in all soils. They're like little tiny worms. Um, they can be safe. They're, they're very specific. Um, they're effective against soil dwelling larvae of many um, species of the beetle. So they do work against, especially Japanese beetle grubs. Um, the problem is, they work great in a test tube, 
they're very tough out in the field. Um, they need constant grubs to divide. So if they do kill the grubs or there's no grubs around, um, if you don't time them exactly as needed um, and they don't have a food source, they'll die out. Um, and um, they're very UV sensitive. Uh, a lot of, they, they suggested that you apply them at night um, when the sun's going down or before the sun comes up in the morning. Um, people generally don't want applicators running around their house at night um, and applicators don't wanna work at night. Uh, the shelf life is very short. Once you get them in, it's about one to two weeks. You have to refrigerate them and use them right away. So you can't anticipate things. Um, they have to ship on ice um, and they're very dependent on soil temperatures. And the biggest failure we see is the need for constant soil moisture. So um, with other products that need to be watered in, chemical or organic, they need to be watered in initially, which you can do, um, the client can do, and then you're done. Problem is we get very dry summers, last year being an exception. Um, but in general, we will we'll have drought here for six, eight, you know, 12 weeks and the nematodes just aren't gonna survive under those conditions. So, um, and the other product that a lot of people have heard about is Milky Spore. So Milky Spore is a bacterium that controls the grubs. Um, um, Barry and I were talking ahead of time, neither of us, even before this product, like Rub Gone came along, carried Milky Spore, even when there were no options. Um, it just has never shown efficacy. Um, it's a bacterium. It, it really only attacked if it did um, uh, the Japanese beetle grubs. Um, and these are just, if you go to any of your local universities and read about them, um, they will pretty much poo-poo Milky Spore. Uh, this is from Yukon. Um, it's been not very successful at controlling grubs and, and it's only specific to the Japanese beetle grubs. Um, UMass, same thing. No evidence that milky spore is effective. Um, no evidence that the commercial preparations increase the incidence of the disease. So the company um, that makes milky spore says do it three times a year for three years. That's nine applications and it'll build up in the soil and it doesn't in New England soils, whether it's because of the pH or other conditions, Cornell's same thing, We're talking about nematodes and milky spore. Um, alternatives have been relatively poor. These are the biologicals and inconsistent. Um, they should not rely on them for grub management in high priority areas. So um, they've pretty much been invalidated and termed ineffective and um, organic applicators certainly had no options. So I'm gonna move on now to um, talk more specifically about the grub guan. So in light of that, in light of the laws, in light of more infections, in light of there not being good organic options and less synthetic options, um, we're gonna talk about this new technology. So what is um, ETG, which is the bacterium um, that's in grub guan and beetle guan, um, the new silver bullet. So I'm gonna backtrack and talk about biological pesticides for a minute. Um, the enemy of my enemies, my friend, I love this um, old um, Chinese proverb, uh, proverb. We hear about it in war um, a lot. So um, the United States didn't like Russia. So we became friends with Iraq until we weren't or didn't like Iran or tends and it tends to backfire. What we're doing with biopesticides, if you're not familiar with them, is we're exploiting nature's natural enemies and commercializing it. So bacterium, like in this case, or fungi, um, nematodes, like we talked about, even viruses. Um, these are natural predators of certain types of insects that kill them. And what we're doing is taking these, isolating them, and um, giving them to you guys in higher concentration to use against these insects. So this is um, a Bt, and Bts are a type of bacterium. Um, many of you have probably heard about them. Uh, it's called Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, this is taking a commercialized bacteria, all natural, um, non-GMO bacteriums, these are, and you're infecting, um, in this case, it's a specific Bt that infects a caterpillar. This is a healthy caterpillar, this is Bt infected. So the bacterium attacks these insects and kills them. Um, so Bt's were first isolated in the early 1900s. Um, in, in fact, the bacteria, the Bacillus thuringiensis family, um, it's a family called, um, and a genus called the Bacillus. Probably a lot of you have heard. This is a very wide range of family. Um, and um, there's currently 82 distinct BT strains of the Bacillus thuringiensis that have been described. Um, they can be found in soils almost anywhere. 
Um, we've all been exposed. Anybody who's ever touched dirt has naturally been around um, B BT bacteria. Um, it's very safe. It's a natural soil microbe. Um, it continues to grow as a very commercially important um, microbe. The um, it's billion dollars on the market. So um, the way these work and the, the cool thing about the BTs is um, they have a, a variety of subspecies um, and each subspecies produces a certain type of toxin. So one type of BT produces one toxin, another, another. Um, and in microbiology and biochemistry, which is my background, we call this a lock and key. So um, each insect has a certain type of receptor in their stomach and it's very selective. And a certain BT toxin will hit a certain receptor um, and basically um, cause a reaction in the insects that will kill them. And certain BTs for caterpillars, mosquitoes, um, um, and different types of fly larvae. Um, and they're basically silver bullets because um, a mosquito doesn't have the receptor that's in a caterpillar. So one type of BT that affects a caterpillar will not harm a fly and vice versa. Um, um, a fly larvae, mosquito larvae, um, that type of BT product will not affect caterpillars. Um, so um, they're, they're really cool products that way. Um, you guys have probably used them or heard of them. Um, BT israeliensis um, goes after diphtheria, which is the true flies, the mosquitoes, fungus gnats, um, black flies for indoor selling. Um, these are dunks that you guys put in the water. Uh, municipalities actually use them a lot now to help control mosquitoes because they won't kill anything in the water, the fish, um, the crustaceans. Um, BT kurtzaki is very popular. Um, those go after caterpillars or lepidoptera family. Gypsy moths, which are we see more and more in this part of the country now. Um, uh, these are sprays, um, things like the Thuricide, um, Dipel, probably a lot of you guys use professionally. And these have been proven, like we said, over the last, um, not even decades, century. Um, these have been used and used uh, more and more. The thing is, um, they're silver bullets, um, but um, they've been safely used without problems. There's never been one for white, white grubs until now. So um, going through some history, um, so BT galleria is a subspecies of BT, just like the other ones I showed you. It was isolated in Japan in 2003 by the head of um, phylum, which makes the grub gone and beetle gone. Um, it was found to produce a toxin that um, was specific to scarab beetles. So scarab beetles um, are the very specific subset of beetles that cause the problems, the pest beetles. Um, the Japanese beetles, Asiatic, Oriental, European chafers um, is very specific for them. Um, they isolated the toxin um, and the gene, and it was um, tested in the field um, for Schaefer control, and it worked. Um, they had significantly better beetle control. Um, and long story short, the product was commercialized, um, patented, and was made into what we now have grub gone and beetle gone. Um, and just so you guys know, um, the BTs in general, Sometimes you'll read about um, being used in um, genetically modified crops. This is not a gen genetically modified bacterium. None of these products I showed you have. What happens is um, pharmaceutical companies like Bayer and others have, um, or Monsanto was a big player, which is now Bayer, um, um, took the genes from certain BTs and put them into plants and the plants grew with these BT genes. Um, so they weren't putting the microbes in there. The microbes aren't genetically modified. They took the genes, put them in the plants. So the plants would produce these toxins. So it's a whole different beast. Um, these are natural bacterium or they, they basically grow the bacterium through fermentation, just like you make beer or wine. Um, this product is grown in batches. Again, just like you make beer or wine and basically powdered, um, dried up and put in these products. So not modified, they're OMRI listed. OMRI would not approve anything that's genetically modified. So um, um, you don't have to worry about that, even though some of the BT proteins have been used um, um, in those ways. So the way this works is, um, this is where I'm gonna geek out. You don't have to memorize this. Um, this is my background, I love to do it. Um, they're, the BTs make what are called cry proteins. And for the BT gallery, it's cry eight. Um, there's all different types of proteins. Um, it's basically sprayed on the leaves as a, a wettable powder or put in the soil. 
for the grubs. Um, the grubs or the beetles eat it. Um, the protein is um, activated in the gut. Um, and again, this lock and key. So only the scarab beetles have this receptor, you know, the, the, the lock being the receptor. And um, this um, protein is the key. And as soon as it hits um, the bacteria and they swallow it, it activates the receptor, which basically pokes a hole in, in the gut of the, the larvae, the grub or the adult beetle. Um, it immediately stops feeding. Um, uh, they become septic and they die. So um, the thing we see is like really within an hour or two, as soon as they ingest the protein, it's not a contact killer, um, they will stop eating but they, they don't die for a couple of days. And um, I, you know, try not to, to harm anything or make it suffer. But um, most people I talk to um, don't mind seeing these beetles and these grubs suffer a little. Um, it's interesting, we get calls that, from people, um, um, just so you guys know as applicators, you'll put down, especially with the beetle gone, you'll put it down one day and they'll come back and people will, will actually ask you and say, hey, it's not working. I see these on the, I see the beetles still on the leaf. And you'll see oriental and Asiatic beetles during the day stunned on the leaf. They're just sitting there. And those are nocturnal beetles. You never see them during the day. Those are the ones with the minor hats. Um, they're there. You just go and shake the leaf and they'll fall right off. They're not eating. They're not doing any more damage, which is what you care about. They'll be dead in a day or two. So um, it's really a silver bullet for scarab beetles and white grubs um, and even some weevils and borers you could use it for. Well, um, yeah, we have a question. Um, sure. And maybe you're you're going to get to this, but um, we have a question about the native or beneficial beetles. Um, are those also killed by grub gone? Um, no, that's a great setup. So I'm actually going to talk about that on the next slide. So um, that's one of the cool things. These truly are silver bullets. So um, um, I'll I'll talk about that in the next slide. So this BT, um, the one in grub gone. Um, is so there's two versions of this, the grub gone and the beetle gone, the same exact um, thing. It's the BT Galleria, um, Galleria um, bacterium. Um, the grub gone is just a, um, it's basically just um, a pellet. Um, it has a, it has a um, porcelain pellet, um, a very nice prill, and they just put the bacterium on the pellet. Um, so that's your granular. The beetle gone is just a wettable powder um that you dissolve and spray on plants and also for grubs you can use it um so the great thing about these unlike any of the other organic products before is they cover all these um these scarab beetles so the japanese oriental asiatic the european shafers as i mentioned this part of the country are more than some of the other shafers weevils um it, it's really cool they're even doing um work on certain borers like the Emerald Dashboard. Um, this company is working with the forestry department um, and spraying it on, on forest to, to stop the Emerald Ash Borer. Um, it doesn't overwinter, um, but neither did Milky Spore or any of the other organic products or any of the synthetics for that. Um, also controls adults. So you can use this against the juvenile grubs or the adult beetles. Um, there's no soil restriction range. Um, it's effective in the Northeast. Um, it works within the application system. Um, and just to compare to Milky Spore, Milky Spore again, um, only went after Japanese beetle grubs and that's controversial. Um, none of these others that are now more prevalent in this part of the country, it didn't overwinter in New England, um, doesn't control adults. Um, you need a temperature range, um, the efficacy is questionable. You need three applications per season, and then they'll tell you it may not work in that first season where this will work immediately. So um, this has at least a two-year shelf life, probably three or four, um, just in the resealable bags, um, no special refrigeration required. And it does work curatively as well, which is a huge thing even over the synthetics. So it works both preventively and curatively, which gives you a lot of options. Um, so it has a much broader um, spectrum and efficacy. Um, and um, compared to like milky spore or nematodes or anything like that that are logistical nightmares. So the other cool thing to get back to the question here in a minute is this has been tested about against all kinds of bees and pollinators. Um, it's completely safe, um, will not affect a pollinator. Um, the BTs, this is a chart from the Xerce Society, which is um, um, the largest and most proactive um, Save the Bee Society in the country. 
Um, and this just shows you it's considered non-toxic, the BT families in general, including this product. Um, the thing that's interesting is when you look at some of the other organics, um, Bovaria bassiana, there's products, diatomaceous earth, um, insecticidal soaps, horticultural oils, um, the spinosids we talked about, and like pyganic pyrethrins, all are still toxic to pollinators. So even though they're organic, organic doesn't mean safe. So we need to be careful with that. Um, this is, um, this gives, you could have your cake and eat it. Um, the other cool thing is not just the bees, but um, things like parasitoid wasps, um, parasitic wasps, which these are wasps that actually um, go into the soil and lay their eggs in the grubs and actually help kill the grubs, won't affect them. Um, this type of um, BT does not affect Lepidoptera. Um, which are caterpillars. Um, so it's very selective as are all the BTs. And back to the question. So ladybugs or lady beetles, which are beneficial, they're actually a different family. Um, this is um, the BT and this product is Scarabidae um, is the family um, um, for, excuse me, the um, white grubs, the scarab beetles are Scarabidae. This is the cockatoo. <laughs> Cochinolidae uh, family of the ladybugs. So this will not affect ladybugs or lady beetles. It's, it's that specific. So um, tests have concerned, uh, uh, confirmed this, um, not only the other insects, but the beneficial nematodes in the soil, which not only do you not need to apply, but the natural nematodes in the soil will also then um, kill the grubs that are there as would the parasito parasitoid um, wasps with this product. So the grub gone can be used, um, again, the granular turf and ornamental use, um, no geographical restrictions like around waters, um, controls the first through third instar grub stages. Um, most of the other organics, in fact, all the other organics um, only control up to the first instar. Um, you gotta get them out before the eggs. Instars are, if you don't know, molting stages. So you go from egg, they hatch into the first instar, they molt, second instar, molt, third instar, um, and then they overwinter. Um, they come back out in the spring and um, they um, then will um, in, the, in the summer become the adult beetles. Um, this will actually control all three instars and even in certain parts of the country and certain types of grubs, they have a fourth instar and down south, they get a second generation comes out. So um, this controls all of them. Um, it's both a preventative and a curative. Again, your customers um, are gonna likely be reactive, not proactive. So you don't have to get this down in April, May, June, and anticipate infection. You can get this down in September, October, when they start to see the damage, even in the spring. Um, great product that way. And that actually beats a lot of the synthetics. Um, no adverse risk as we covered. Um, uh, the re-entry is as soon as it dries, which is the minimal the EPA will allow. Um, you can apply it near water um, and it's on listed organic. Um, so not GMO, not anything like that. The beetle gone, same thing, just the wettable powder. It's made for spraying on the, the tree, shrubs, annuals, um, edibles. It's, it, you could spray it on edibles and harvest right away. Um, no restrictions on it and turf as well for the grubs. So those that want to do liquid application, it's a great option as well. Um, and a lot of organic guys do that because they do liquid options um, or applications in the summer. You can mix this right in with just about anything and um, you can kill two birds with one stone instead of going back and doing a granular. Um, active against, again, a lot of the, the beetle types, um, weevils, boars, um, no adverse risk to any um, non-targets and um, NOP compliant, which means national organic protocol. So um, anybody, when you go to the grocery store and you see USDA organic, when you buy your food, that means they can use a product like this. It's, it's approved for organic growers. Any questions? Yeah, Joe, I have a question. Um, sure, Barry. Regarding Japanese beetles, adult beetles, um, yep. how, many, how many applications would you recommend? It's a good question. Um, I got a, a section at the end where we talk about the applications, but um, it's about every seven to 10 days. Okay. So usually one or two a season because they go elsewhere during that point. It's a, it's a short season. You know, it's about a, about a month they're out before they're laying the eggs. So and usually what happens, they come out like, this part of the country, July 1st or 4th, like clockwork. It's amazing. And yeah. um, um, as you know, um, so first sight, um, right around there, you could spray it. And, um, and then about every seven to 10 days, depending on the watering, um, you know, or excuse me, the rain. Um, you can also use a sticker with this. Like we suggest new film 
um, you know, for the organic eyes, but any sticker that you use helps you prolong the life with this. Um, but um, I, I would say, you know, a week, but in general, if the beetles that first week or two, when they're mating and they come out, um, if they're not going to eat there, they're going to go somewhere else. So it's your neighbor's problem. So any more problem uh, questions? All right. So proof of efficacy. Um, so this is the thing that really has distinguished this. I, Joe, I, Joe think, I do have a question. Sure. Um, needs to be watered in, right? For the grubs, yes. It needs to be watered initially, just like the chemicals or anything else. What, one inch? About a half, you know, quarter inch. Um, you know, just to get it below the surface, it's not UV sensitive, like um, as sensitive as like nematodes. So, but if it starts to sit for, you know, a week, you can lose efficacy um, with it. So you want to get it in within the first few days. Um, a quarter of an inch, just enough for the pellets. You'll see the pellets sit on the surface and um, they're, they're tiny pellets, but um, you won't see the pellets anymore. They dissolve fairly quickly. So about a quarter inch, I would say. Um, so, you want to go deeper later in the season when the grubs are deeper in the ground. Right. So if you're doing a, a fall application, mm -hmm. you might want to push it down farther, half inch. Yeah. I mean, it's just going to take longer to work because it's an, it has to be ingested. So if the grubs are half an inch and your product's sitting a quarter of an inch, it's not going to decay but um, uh, right away, but you know, it's not being ingested. I've, I usually see the grubs at the surface. So I think as long as you initially get it into the surface, let's say a quarter of an inch of rain or water, um, it's good. It's, you know, it's a problem like with any of these, you know, synthetic or organic, because especially in this part of the country, um, I can go five miles down the road and it's pouring and I don't, I miss the storm. It's really hard to time these things this time of the year. So what we do for an application window to make your life easier is we'll say anywhere from mid July, if you want to do it, um, um, you know, mid to late July, hopefully late July to like mid to late August, if you want to use it um, preventatively. And that gives you about a three week window to time some rain. So, um, and then you could still apply it anytime after that curatively. Mid July to late August. I would say like, yeah, late July. Um, the product stays three months in the soil. So if you go late July, you're going to cover the season. But that gives you a window to time rain. And even if you have to go later into August, it's fine because you don't get that much damage when the when the grubs hatch, you know, by late August. So it's yeah. not like it's not like a conventional product that you like, you really need to water in within 24 hours to activate it, push it down one inch. Well, right. If it's sitting at the surface, it's not going to do anything because it's not being ingested. So it's not working. Um, but, um, and it will degrade after a week or so, it'll start to break down. Um, and that's where we've seen failures when people haven't watered in. But yeah, you ideally you want to get it in within the first day or two. It's, it's, it's basically the same thing with, with fertilizer. You, you let the client yeah. know you got to water it in. Right. You got to water it in. Nitrogen will start to break down and gas off. Right. You, you want to get it in as quickly as you can. It's not always 100% feasible, but you, you want to do your best in that window. Joe, um, yeah. can, can the uh, Grubby Gone, can that be applied with a fertilizer? Yes. Um, so it's a granular. It's hard to mix two different granulars, you know, in the same spreader, but the liquid, certainly a lot of people do that. Um, you know, I don't suggest heavy fertilization during the summer, especially if there's not irrigation, but yes, you can absolutely put it in the summer with um, just about anything else. Um, you know, in other insecticide application, you could put it in with your fertilizers. A lot of people do inoculants, compost teas, things like that. It can be mixed in with all this. That would be the beetle gone, the wettable powder. Anybody else? All right, so I'm gonna move on to the uh, proof of efficacy because this is the thing that really distinguishes this product. Um, they've really done their homework. Like I said, um, I've been in this industry for 12 years and this, I just wrote an article this summer for Turf Magazine and, and I can say honestly, and I put it as the first line, um, no organics is no longer a compromise. When I started um, 12 years ago, I used to say um, mosquito control, um, selective and 
and preventative um, or pre-emergent weed control and grub control were the holy grails of organics. Uh, grub control is now completely off that. In fact, these, these products works as well as synthetics. Um, and the selective weed killers have gotten better. Pre-emergents are still suffering um, as is mosquito control. Um, that's another talk, but this is truly um, something I've never seen in the organic world, even some of the synthetics. So these are just the, the pictures. Um, this is um, you know out in California doing a park. This is a grub damaged um, lawn. Um, this is treated a thick, health plush, uh, healthy plush lawn. This was an accidental experiment. A client of mine did in Connecticut. Um, didn't buy enough product, went with his spreader around the outside and worked in. Um, got to about here, um, ran out of product and said, ah, it's fine, I probably won't get the grubs. Um, came to me a few weeks later, and this is the picture. He's pulling grubs out, show me the grubs. Um, you could see the difference. The grub damage can be extensive. Whether it's a primary, the grubs eat in the roots or the animals digging up the lawn, which can be more devastating than primary damage. Um, a skunk, what they could do in, in a night, um, the birds in hours, um, and certainly moles in the yard. Um, this looks a little bit like mole damage, but um, that was an accidental experiment. And he sent me a picture, which was pretty cool. Um, that's the anecdotal stuff, but this is the real stuff. Um, so these guys, um, the graphs I'm gonna show you, and I'm not gonna dwell on all these, but um, these graphs show percent control. So basically, 100% um, control means every grub was gone. These are grub studies. 0% um, control is basically the untreated areas and they just normalize. They'll say, okay, this is untreated. And you know, this is if we had no grubs at all and in between. So 70% is what the universities say. 70% control of the grubs is what universities generally say is a great baseline to use. Um, you don't need to kill every grub. You wanna get them under usually five to 10 um, grubs per square foot um, and 70% gets you in that range in the most cases. So this is grub gone. Um, they did two different um, concentrations of the grub gone. This is what we suggest. This is a higher rate of grub gone. And this is actually Merit, which is one of the um, tougher, uh, the neonic um, of the synthetics. And you see statistically grub gone work just as well as Merit. Uh, this was done by Dr. Rick Brandenburg um, against June beetle grubs at NC State. Um, and this is a preventative trial. So preventative, yes, we expect that. Um, no organic products have reached that um, sort of efficacy. Um, and uh, Brandenburg is a pretty well-known entomologist. So uh, preventatively, um, grub go on work just as well as merit. Um, this was done by David Shetler, who's, if you guys know him, he's probably one of the, he's partially retired now, but one of the top, um, uh, entomologist in the country at Ohio State. Um, he calls himself the, the bug doc, Dave. Um, he did, again, preventative here. Um, this is Japanese and Schaefer grubs, mixed population, um, preventatively here. Um, grub gone worked um, as well as grub X. Um, so that's the preventative. What's cool though, is now looking at Meridian, another synthetic against grub gone, this is curative. So he did it both ways. And again, statistically, Grub one is curative, you know, by one of the best entomologists in the country and goes head to head with the synthetics and performs just as well. So uh, it works against the synthetics and works both as a curative and a preventative. Um, here more locally, um, this is Dr. Um, Patricia Vidim up, um, at UMass. She's also now retired or partially. Um, she did this against a uh, curative study, again, against your oriental beetles. So a different species, again, up against Merit and Neonic, which is banned. So you guys, um, when the Neonics are off the market in New Jersey, um, they're coming off the market partially in October, Barry told me um, of next year, you're not gonna be allowed to use this. You'd now have a product that you can use that'll work um, just as well. Um, Rick Brandenburg again, um, again, another, he also did the curative trial against uh, green June beetles, um, grub gone, um, you know, 80, 90, almost 100% efficacy, um, and just as well as Dilox, um, Beer Advanced, and GrubX. So um, again, another curative trial, um, just as well. Um, and again, David Shetler um, as a curative trial, mass shafers in Japanese, so again, different species um, against Merit, um, just as well. So against the Neonix um, and some of the harsher synthetics. Um, this is against Dilox, which is really, you know, kind of the nuclear option that people use against scrubs as a curative. 
uh, UC Grubb go on again. Um, this was a very tough study. Um, the cool thing about this is this is third instar. So these are um, late in the season, those th uh, thick, juicy grubs um, in the soil. This is a tough trial right here. And you see grub gone worked statistically just as well, if not better than Dilox, um, at about 60% control in a very hard third instar study curatively. Um, so again, the good thing about this is this is also killing the beneficial nematodes in the soil. Um, the ladybugs, um, pollinators, um, and also the parasitic wasps, the um, very nature system of killing the grubs, that remains intact here or not here, and you're getting just as good control. Um, so that, that's really interesting. Um, and again, just weevils, which a lot of you guys probably aren't interested in, but against another synthetic, um, you know, works just as well um, against weevils as well. Um, as far as the adult beetles, um, this is a study um, they were doing for potted plants. Um, I think Cornell's done some studies on potted plants. Um, before growers can send potted plants out, they have to treat for grubs so they don't spread throughout the country. Um, the interesting thing is this is um, Dilox uh, pre-treating the potted plants um, versus um, beetle gone. Not only does it take care of the grubs, but uh, because these are beneficial microbes, they actually have growth enhancement properties, as you see with a lot of the other biocontrols. Um, so that's, that's also another beneficial uh, side effect. So um, this is a study, this is called, um, this is against the adult beetles by Dr. Chris Williamson at University of Wisconsin, percent foliage skeletonized. So this is with the Japanese beetles, you see skeletonized foliage, like every, the, vein, the veins of the leaf stay there, but not the foliage itself. Um, and this is the untreated. So this is a percent that's, um, that's actually destroyed by the uh, beetles. Um, and this is what isn't. So you see against the pyrethrins, um, beetle gone in this case, sprayed on the foliage, work just about as well as um, the pyrethrins in this study. Um, and this is on wine, um, on grapes, excuse me, <laughs> wine grapes. Um, must almost be happy hour. Um, um, which are favorite roses um, and grapes are favorite of the Japanese beetles. So work just as well against those. Um, this is a weevil study um, done at um, UC Davis. Again, percent um, control of the weevils. And you see right here, beetle guan um, was used at two different concentrations. Again, it's the same. This is what we suggest. And you look, these are all the, the harsh of the harsh of the chemicals. Um, it performed and, you know, one of the biological Grandivo, um, that really showed very little efficacy, um, you know, worked as well or almost as well as some of the synthetics. So certainly for beetles um, at a couple studies. So any questions about that before we talk about the application rates? All right. Um, so as we said, um, the grub gone is the granular, go through spreaders, um, the beetle gone is a wettable powder. Um, you know, the turf um, on turf, you can use the grub gone um, as the granular. And, and you know, people, when I started in the industry, everybody's doing granulars, now we're seeing more liquids. Um, it's a shame they, they named this beetle gone. It was originally intended just to be a foliar spray and people wanted to do uh, more liquids. So they went back, they did a big study at NC State and they compared both the granular and the liquid and they compared it against synthetics and they performed exactly the same in terms of grubs. So they went back and changed the label and it's now approved for the grubs um, in the adult beetles. Um, and when you compare price and efficacy, efficacy is exactly the same. The price is about the same too per thousand square feet. So six, one half dozen, the other it comes down to how you want to do your application. Like, you know, some of the other questions before, um, this can be mixed in a liquid tank with other things and it could save you a step. Um, some people don't do liquid apps, uh, not during that time of the year. So you have two options. Um, and for foliars against the adults, um, you can't take the granulars and redissolve them. It gets gooey because of the, um, um, you know, what it takes to make the pearl of the pellet there, um, um, the porcelain. So um, you can't use this and spray it on. People have tried that and called me. It's a mess. Um, so the beetle gone is, um, you know, as far as a foliar is, is a two in one for grubs and beetles. If you want to get just one where the grub one um, works um, only against the grubs in the soil. And this is just sprayed on like we discussed before, uh, as soon as you see the beetles and um, about every seven to 10 days. So as far as again, the grub life cycle, um, um, in August, um, you know, the, the beetles, you see the adult beetles come out July, 
um, um, late June for June beetles and earlier in some parts of the country. But you know, June, you see certain types of beetles, but July is really when you see the Japanese, Oriental and Asiatics at night. Um, it's really when they come out right at the beginning of July, they're around for about a month and you don't see them. They lay their eggs late July, early August and mid August, the eggs start to hatch the first instar and they divide a couple of times to the instar stages. Um, by late October, um, they start to go underground and uh, they go dormant um, deep in the soil for the winter. Um, and they come back up in the spring um, as the third in star grubs. Most of your turf damage is done in this range, like late August through September, October. Um, you will get the preventative people here, as we discussed. Um, you can put it down. Um, that time frame we talked about earlier, late July through August, um, as a preventative. Um, and if you do this in this time of the year, it's a once a year application. You get it down. Uh, you kill them here in their life cycle, and you don't need it the rest of the year until the adults come back in July and relay the eggs and the cycle starts. Um, again, the other thing is most of the damage happens, I would say September, October, and you're going to get two types of customers. You get the customers that come to you in September that didn't do a curative treatment, and they say, hey, um, I've got moles in my yard. Um, the skunks are digging it up. What's going on? You find the grubs. That's actually a good scenario. Um, because those are like the canary in the gold mine. Um, you can still get the grubs in September before a lot of the damage is done. You'll also get the call in October um, with the client who's mowing their lawn and the lawn's coming up like tumbleweeds and just blowing off because the root damage is so extensive. Um, that certainly you kill the grubs, but you're resodding um, or replanting that lawn and you can't reverse that damage. You can get the grubs, so the new lawn doesn't get damaged, but um, um, you hope to get the call August, September, but you can still treat in October, even into November now with um, some of the later um, falls we've gotten. Now in the spring, when the grubs come back up, this is where you see more of the animal damage. Again, the moles, the skunks, um, it still works here. You could still absolutely treat here. Um, to help that secondary damage. The problem is here, if you treat, the cycle starts anew. Again, this is three months in the soil. The cycle starts anew in July. You may have to treat again that year. Um, so if you do treat in the spring, um, it's very likely you have to also do a fall treatment. So just tell your clients that, um, set expectations. The other thing a lot of people don't understand the life cycle is they treat in the spring and think it's like a synthetic um, and they're good in the fall and they say it didn't work because they came back in the fall and it's actually the next life cycle starting. So applied in this in the fall and summer, once a year here, it's probably a twice a year treatment. So um, won't get the next generation. Um, as far as application rates, um, you know, and certainly Barry can help you. In general, um, for the grub lawn, it's about two pounds per thousand square feet. Um, and um, a 10 pound bag would cover 5,000 square feet. A 40 pound bag, which is the other way it comes, um, covers 20,000 square feet. So it's about two, two to the 40 pound bags um, per acre. Um, so that, that's nine of the 10 pound bags. Um, um, for the liquid beetle gone, you put about half a pound of the beetle gone per thousand square feet. That's um, about a little less than half a cup per gallon of water. Um, again, that would be the same efficacy, same price as um, um, you get with the, um, with the grub gone. Um, an eight ounce bag covers 2000 um, square feet. Um, there's there's um, two pound bags, which will cover about 4,000. And there's a five pound bag that would cover 20,000. So the five pound bag is a beetle gone is equivalent to the 40 pound bag of grub gone. So um, as far as the beetles, um, you want to put, again, one to two ounces of the beetle gone, which is about that half a cup per gallon of water and spray just to wet. And we do suggest the, um, the sticker for that to help prolong the life. The stickers tend to be cheaper than the product itself. So if you get extended even three, four days in heavy rain, um, then you use it. We talked about that. Um, new film, which is a terpene we talked about already, um, is a suggested organic one. And nursery stocks, that probably doesn't affect most of you guys, but it can be used in those nursery stocks um, before they're shipped out. So summary, um, the big thing right now with the product is the price. Um, so, you know, this chart just shows um, the cost per thousand. This is um, 
Grub Gone versus a lot of the synthetics. You see, it is, it is gonna be more expensive than the synthetics. Um, but when you look at here, the performance, it performs as well as we showed as the synthetics. Safety is of course off the charts. Um, you know, a lot of the synthetics don't even, in the safety scale here, don't even measure um, where this is, um, you know, is, is safe for the environment, safe for animals, safe for beneficials. Um, you can feel good about it. Um, and it's the only organic product that actually reaches that threshold. So in terms of the organics, um, the price is fairly comparable to a lot of the organics. This is like Milky Spore. When you do the three applications a year, it's actually more expensive with less efficacy. Like this is a no brainer. Um, you know, if you're getting 80% efficacy um, and, you know, the price can come out to about $9 per thousand. Barry will help you with pricing, but you know, generally that range. Um, nematodes, half the efficacy, you know, just slightly cheaper. And that's probably more expensive now to ship them when you account for everything. Um, as, as an Arachnid, um, another thing people ask about a lot is the cedar oils. Um, cedar oils, again, if they work, um, they work probably by repelling the, the beetles, the adults in July. Um, I haven't seen good luck. I haven't seen a lot of studies showing they work. Uh, most say otherwise. I think the studies that were done were done down south where they have really sandy soil, not organic matter. Up here, that oil gets caught up in the organic matter and broken down before it can actually kill in the soil. Um, it's very cheap, but um, you're not really getting what you pay for. So in summary, um, these products are gonna work as well as synthetics for both grubs and beetles. Um, Similar or lower cost than certainly other organic products and you know, much more efficacy. Um, they can be used preventatively or curatively, which, and through the first and third instar, so all life cycles of the grub, which even a lot of the synthetics can't say, certainly none of the organics. Um, you know, the safety profile is great. Um, Silver Bullet um, doesn't kill pollinators or the beneficials. Also gives you the flexibility with the granular or the wettable. Uh, shelf stable for two plus years. You don't need to refrigerate it. Um, and you, you know, don't need to apply it at night. Um, so finally, you know, a product that's highly effective, safe, cost effective, and uh, will control adult and, um, and juvenile beetles. So thank you. Any questions? Is there a certain temperature, Joe, that, that impacts or does temperature impact uh, beetle be gone or grub gone? No, um, it does not. Um, you can put this down any time of the year. It's not going to kill the microbes. They'll be dormant. Um, the thing is, there's no reason to apply it before the grubs are active. So my rule of thumb would be the, the typical 50 degree soil temperatures. That's really when the grubs become active again and the, the turf starts growing and um, um, they start feeding you know, the microbes. Everything starts around four, uh, 50 degrees. So in general, you probably don't wanna apply it before the soils are 50 degrees. There's no value in that. But if you had to get out earlier, you certainly can. But it's not gonna die if you get it out colder or hotter, unlike nematodes or other products. Anybody else? I don't see any more questions in the in the chat. Okay. Any any uh, any risk to applying too little? This is Dan. Hi, Joe. Hey, Nicely done. Dan, Thank you. Good to see you. Um, there's no risk except um, yes. If you're below the threshold, you still get the damage, and your clients aren't happy. So um, you know you want to you want to do about the two pounds per thousand of the grub one um, and. It, with heavier infestations, if you're like in the 10, I've seen people have counted 20 per thousand, uh, not per thousand, per square foot. Um, you may want to go to a higher like three pounds per thousand rate. So, um, but in general, as long as you knock them below the five per square foot, you know, if you have below five grubs per square foot, um, universities don't even suggest treating. So, so the, the, the only damage is to your um, your customer's happiness and your uh, your online ratings, right, Dan? <laughs> there you go. Very, very important. Yeah, we've we've applied it before and uh, we've had good luck. I just remember it's uh, it's difficult. You know, we're always worried about not getting enough down. So I think we wind up doing four or five pounds. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You 
there's no um, toxicity to over applying. I've never seen that. It's just more, it's an expensive product. You know, you want to find that line. The two pounds per thousand is your best um, value in terms of efficacy versus price to keep it within a reasonable price range for your clients. So, so price wise, some people will put down like a salaprin, right? Right. Uh, and, and what's the active ingredient in, in that? Um, well, salaprin is. Um, the it's chlorian tranilipril, I think. Um, <laughs> right. So yeah, um, no, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, and that's a molting inhibitor. So, you know, huh. of the synthetics, the acelaprin is certainly the safest. It works very well. Um, I think they're starting to see some resistance. The problem with that is because it's a molting inhibitor around waterways, there's a lot of restrictions still with it. So got it. <clears throat> How's the, how does the price compare for uh, taking care of the problem? I don't know the synthetics. Um, as well as the organics, as you know, but um, I would see like probably, I would say two to three times the price. Um, but the other value mm -hmm. with this is a celeprin is preventative. So mm -hmm. let's say you're paying two or three times the price and you're putting it down as part of a routine on your lawns, right? Um, only 10% of those lawns are going to get the grubs. 90% of that money you wasted. You didn't need it. Where this you could use curatively. So, you know, if you can scout somehow or just check back in August, September, um, you don't have to treat those 90% of the lawns with this product. Excellent. Yeah, I, I know I've seen a, a Celeprin uh, on some quotes and, and RFPs and things. And, and then uh, I was at a uh, awkward moment in an oral exam with the state of Connecticut. And they try mm -hmm. to teach, they try to teach their licensees to, uh, to do IPM and to avoid things like synthetics. Right. And, but the guy sat there and he said, I want to do a preventive grub treatment. Give me a chemical. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and, and so, uh, much, so many applicators just put it in the program just so they can make money, whether there's a grub problem or not. Right, because yeah, cl clients don't realize it. The, the thing that's interesting is the, the grubs tend to come back to similar properties. And it is, it is a disadvantage you're doing organics is um, for whatever reason, organic lawns are going to have more grubs, probably because insects are going to lay their eggs in healthy lawns. They're healthier. Um, there's no pesticides in the soil. Um, and an insect is preferentially going to treat it. Um, Steve Bousquet of American Landscapes, one of the biggest in Connecticut, uh, just a bright guy. He said to me one day, he noticed the grubs um, were in properties where there was landscape lighting and sports fields where lights were on, which makes total sense. It was like a eureka moment because the Japanese beetles, right? You put your light on during the, during the summer and they're at your door. They're, they're attracted to the light. Well, they're going to come to the yards where there's lights and big picture windows. He noticed it. And um, hmm. so that was something I never thought about, but I thought it was a pretty neat association. Um, organic lawns. And it just seems applicators will tell me if they do five lawns in a neighborhood, for whatever reason, they come back to the same lawns over and over. It could have to do with what you also have in the landscape. So if you have roses, um, if you have basil, if you have things that the beetles like, um, they're going to be attracted to their property and probably lay their eggs there so that the, the grubs in the next generation comes out where there's a, a food source every year. So um, factors like that play into it. Yeah, excellent points. The, the uh, states, when they license, they try to teach people to, uh, to, to think about the plants and the environment and the lighting and everything right. and avoid synthetics. And yet these guys get their licenses and they just want to do the cheapest stuff, but do it all the time proactively totally contrary to what the states are hoping they're going to do uh, for yep. a better environment. Amazing. And Yukon does a really neat thing. So anybody also doing, you know, landscaping and plant healthcare, um, they had a big study where they put peonies in a field and peonies attract the parasit uh, parasitic wasps and then the wasps mm -hmm. then lay their eggs in the grubs. So they found, and there's a couple studies on this by having peonies in the um, landscape, um, you actually get better grub control naturally. So it, it's similar to what they're doing IPM. So peonies, if, if you have to choose, put peonies around a yard, and that'll also help grub control. So uh, let nature do its work. Nice. Thanks. Yep. So excellent. Real good information. Again, timely. Um, it's, it's great to hear good news these days. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah. And the, the price didn't really go up this year. And yeah, no, thanks. Thanks okay. for inviting me, Barry. You're always a pleasure to work well, with. Sure. Uh, well, years. Yeah. yeah. 
Joe, good you're, luck. You're, you're terrific. Your 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 presentation's great. Your science is phenomenal, and you're a good guy on top. But, um, Thank you. So the other good news, um, <laughs> you know, these days with prices going through the roof and shortages, um, Joe told me all, earlier uh, that there is no shortage of these two products. Yep. Yeah, it has been a problem in past years. I think they've taken yeah. care of most of the. We we did have backups, but I've already ordered for the year, um, and it's coming in, so we shouldn't have issues. Okay. And Barry, oh. while we have everyone on, can you um, can you tell us about next week? Sure. Next week, um, a good friend of mine, Mike Colonot, the owner of Lincoln Landscaping, um, will be giving his talk on his experience. Uh, treating lawns and, and, and uh, landscapes organically. The, the short story, um, two, uh, probably 12 years ago, I, I did have Chip Osborne come to New Jersey a few times and he gives his two day course. And um, <laughs> at the end of the course, I hadn't met Mike at the point, at that point, but I went up to him like everybody and said, so what do you think? And he says that, he says, he's gonna switch cold turkey to organics and i cautioned him about it because that's <laughs> not always that's not always successful but you know he made his, his mistakes but he learned and he got better and better and better and he'll, he'll tell you his story next week on how you know it, it's it's just changed his life for him he just feels so good about what he's doing and his business has grown so much doing doing these kinds of services for people so yeah and it can be done right Barry yes yep. yeah uh, yes and more and more people are doing it more and more homeowners and school grounds are asking for this kind of service and it's just it, it's the right time it's the uh -huh. right time absolutely so again thank you everybody um you know go to our website you you can place your orders right now for grub going and deal going have it on stock um so okay thank you much thanks everybody thank you good night